How's everybody doing? Not bad. I'm doing pretty good myself. So we're listening to some Native American flute music. And I decided the other day to buy a Native American flute because I love the sound. It's so soothing and meditative. So I ordered one. Yeah. It comes in uh, next week sometime. I think like Thursday or something. It's so relaxing and it's very, uh, I know I'll have to play it in class. It's not too difficult to play, they say, because the spacing of all the holes is um, such that I think any combination sounds pretty good if you just cover them, if you cover the holes properly, if you don't blow too hard. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Is it played like a recorder or a flute? Like a recorder, um, they say that if you've played flute before, then it would be very easy for you to pick up the Native American flute. Because I don't think it requires as much breath control. So maybe it's more like a recorder because it's just a little friendlier, a little easier to play, but it has a more pleasant sound. That's how musical instruments go for me. I hear something and then I'm like, ooh, this is really great. And then I can't get it out of my head. And then I buy that instrument and then play it all the time. Until another thing catches my attention. Michael, did you say you play guitar? I can't remember. That's how you got into the cello? Oh man, I love the sound of the cello. It has such a rich tone. Very mellow, warm. Such a beautiful sound. I told you I play viola, right? Oh, you saw Yo-Yo Ma live? Oh, you saw him live? I'm jealous. Yeah, I play viola. Um, that's the instrument I've played the longest. Man, I started that in like third grade. Played, um, you know, in school, played in orchestra. I was in the Phoenix Youth Symphony, but I always loved the sound of the cello. Like if I could go back, it's a funny story actually, like I remember my mom asking me, do you want to play viola? And when she told me viola, in my head I was thinking it would be a cello. Back then I didn't really have it clear in my head what they were. And then she showed up with a viola. Not a cello. And that's how I started playing. That's how you started playing trumpet? What instrument did you confuse a trumpet for? I thought, <laughs> I thought I was playing trombone. That's so funny. I wonder how many kids get mixed up like that and they end up playing, uh, you said the wrong word. It, 
That has to happen to a lot of people. That's really funny. I just want to talk about music today, but we probably have to do dynamics. You stuck with it until freshman year of high school. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like, I don't know, with instruments and practicing, as a kid, I think it's very rare to enjoy practice. Like, I hated to practice, but my mom would force me. And then eventually, though, you get good enough to where it's relaxing to play. So I'm really thankful that my mom was like, look, I know you hate it. You're gonna play, kid. Because now I can pick up instruments and it's, it's, it's fun to just tinker with. That's how it is with anything, I guess. Eventually you get some fluency and then it's more relaxing. Okay, so. I'm not sure because even though I was really bad at piano, I stuck with it until I got decent at it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Practice makes maybe not perfect, but practice makes you better every day. So Monday we or wait, Wednesday. What day is it? Wednesday we covered frequency response functions. We ran this experiment with a motor where we provided different frequencies of voltages and looked at how the motor spun as a result. And today I kind of want to go through that content sort of a second time and add more detail um, because it was a lot. So I'm going to try to make it um, more and more clear with this lecture. So if you have the handout, you can follow along with me. Or if you're catching up with this later, you can also get that handout. I think that's the best way to participate. Okay, so Everything in this class starts with a differential equation. So let's start with this one. It's a first order differential equation. And um, I'm just gonna say that my input of interest is x of t. And I'm gonna say my, oh wait, 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 I switched these. That's not the input, that's the output. So our output is y of t, our input is u of t. So first step is let's get the transfer function, which by definition the transfer function is the Laplace transform of the output divided by the Laplace transform of the input Okay, so what I like to do first is take the Laplace transform of the differential equation. Okay, and We're going to assume the initial conditions are zero because that's the definition for a transfer function. 
That's why I didn't even list the initial conditions with the differential equation. Okay, if you do that, we're going to have s times x of s minus 1 over tau x of s. That's going to equal 1 over tau f of s. And then I like to form the ratio x of s over f of s. So you can just algebraically manipulate this and you're going to get 1 over tau divided by s minus 1 over tau. Oh, why did I put a minus here? There should be a plus, right? Because we're just looking at this equation up here and there's a plus sign. Okay, and so, okay, I, I formed that ratio, but I wanna write this a little bit differently. So I'm gonna multiply it by tau over tau, which is just one, it doesn't change anything, but it makes it so that this is one over tau s plus one. All right, now the transfer function is y of s over u of s. And maybe I'll put this over here. From our we know that our output, I defined it as equal to x. So if I take the Laplace transform of that, y of s is just equal to x of s. Well, that means our transfer function in this case is just equal to that ratio we made earlier, x of s over u of s. So it's, um, 1 over tau s plus 1. And I will put a box around it. Okay. Now, what we like to do for transfer functions is instead of writing that ratio over and over again, we just define some variable. And often we choose G for transfer functions. I'm not sure why, but I'll define G of S to be this transfer function we came up with. Okay, so we're talking about frequency response functions. What is a frequency response function? So it is our transfer function evaluated at s equals i omega. So if I go to my transfer function and, and I plug in i omega where s is, I get this. Um, I want to write it this way though. Now we don't like to have imaginary numbers in the denominator. So a little trick you can do if you have a complex number in the denominator is you multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate. So it's just the negative of the imaginary part. And what you're gonna do 
I went through um, a little more detail on this last time, but I'm going to give you the final result here. The imaginary part in the bottom is going to cancel out. And you're going to be left with this. And um, we can break this into real and imaginary parts. So the real part is 1 over 1 plus omega squared t squared. I mean, this was a tau, but I just started writing it as a t. I'm going to go back and change those to little taus. Okay, this is the real part. And then the imaginary part is this. Minus omega tau over 1 plus omega squared tau squared i. So this is our frequency response function. Let's put a box around that. Okay, the important pieces of information we grab from the frequency response function, well, there's two of them. Number one is the magnitude. Number two is the phase. So first I'm just gonna show you how to calculate these and then we'll talk about the significance of them. But this is the definition of the magnitude. It's the square root of the real part of the frequency response function squared plus the imaginary part of the frequency response function squared. So just to reiterate, well, what's the real part of the frequency response function? Oops. It's this. So we're gonna have to square that thing. What's the imaginary part? Well, it's the coefficient of that imaginary term. So don't forget the negative sign. That is important. Okay. So then, identifying these parts, let's calculate the magnitude. It's going to be the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. Take the square root of that. So that would be 1 over 1 plus omega squared tau squared squared. And then the imaginary part is minus omega tau squared. And then it has the same denominator, so... I can just put that in there. And this, it turns out the numerator and the denominator share a common term. And you can simplify this to one over the square root of one plus omega squared tau squared. And we'll put a box around this. Now, um, just to make this perfectly clear though, all of these calculations I'm doing, this is specific to the transfer function that we started with. So we had a first order system with this tau coefficient and whatever. If you had a different differential equation with different inputs and outputs defined, um, you'd get a different transfer function and the frequency response function would look different. All right, so that's the magnitude. Let's do the phase. So it's defined as the inverse tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. 
So let's. Well, let's use red. Let's calculate it. So the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, negative omega tau over one plus omega, omega squared tau squared, divided by the real part, which is just one over one plus omega squared tau squared. These denominator terms are gonna cancel. And we're left with the inverse tangent of negative omega tau divided by one. So this is where the negative um, for that imaginary part becomes important. Because if you had left that out, um, you're gonna get a totally different angle here. Okay, so if you have a frequency response function, you can always calculate the magnitude and the phase using these general formulas. So you can always apply that to a frequency response function. This is what it looks like when you follow through that calculation for this particular first order system. Okay, so the next part, let's talk about the significance of this a little bit. What do these two quantities tell you? Okay. So, um, they tell you about the steady state sinusoidal response of a linear system, which is talking about if you give an input to a system that is a sinusoid your output whatever you define it to be at steady state and steady state by the way it's just saying if we let this system run um, for a little bit of time so as time tends towards infinity although you don't have to go all the way to infinity to see steady state behavior. Um, so just to be, it's just after transient dynamics have decayed. Well, actually we could, we could be more specific after the settling time. A linear system, it has transient dynamics. That's like the homogeneous response. But after the settling time, if your system is stable, those dynamics go to zero and you're just left with the particular solution. And that looks like this. So I put this sub SS for steady state. Okay, so look at this. This is saying if I give a sinusoidal input, well, my output is going to also be a sinusoid. Um, it's going to have the same frequency. But this is what the phase of the frequency response function tells you. This is our phase delay. That's the significance of it. Like uh, a physical system in real life, if you provide an input, well, it takes the system some time to react. So if my input is going at a certain frequency, sinusoid, whatever, the output's going to delay that or it's going to follow that a little bit. Okay. Let's talk about the amplitude of this sinusoid. So this combined term out in front is the amplitude of the output sinusoid. So
you could say that this magnitude of the frequency response function scales the output amplitude. And we'll talk about this in more detail below. Because, okay, so let's look on this left-hand side here. The significance of this magnitude term. Okay, what happens to the output amplitude if the magnitude of the frequency response function is between 0 and 1? It can never be negative, by the way. That's why I put um, between 0 and 1, because the magnitude of something is always going to be positive. Magnitude is similar to like a length quantity. You can't have negative length. Well, if this is between 0 and 1, this just means the output amplitude will be less than the input magnitude, or amplitude, I should say. Because I'm going to have A, the amplitude, I multiply it by a number less than 1, so it'll be a smaller output amplitude. And this has a special name. It's called attenuation. You might have heard this before. In signal processing or something. Or if you're a sound engineer, this is a very important thing. You're thinking about these types of properties when you make an amplifier or a digital filter of some part or some kind. Some frequencies you might want to attenuate, others you might want to amplify. You have to keep that in mind when you're making a filter. Okay, let's say that this is equal to one. Well, that just means the output amplitude is the same as the input amplitude. And if this is bigger than one, output amplitude is greater than input amplitude. Greater. And we call that amplification. That's what an amplifier does. If you plug in a guitar, actually I have an amplifier behind me. Where did it go? There, a bass amplifier. You can see it right behind my shoulder. But you plug in an instrument and it creates a low amplitude electrical signal. The amplifier amplifies that in the output and creates I bet your neighbors love that you bet they do dude that thing can shake a house and it's very heavy very very heavy Okay, let's talk about phase. I ran a 2400 watt monoblock car audio amp back in the day. Oh, buddy. Did that vibrate your whole car? 141 decibels? We're going to talk about decibels today, my friends. You just sold your Mesa Boogie triple rectifier. <laughs> oh my goodness.
crazy loud. If you guys like amplifiers and all this stuff, you're really gonna enjoy Bodhi Plots. I wish we had like a little bit longer in the class because then I could get really into detail on those. I bet you would like it. We'll talk a little bit about it. We'll give you the fundamentals. Okay, let's talk about the phase. What's the significance of the phase? So I mentioned this earlier. If this is negative, the output lags the input. So, uh, we'll just draw that to make it really clear. You have this input sinusoid, and you're going to see the output is lagging it. It's like behind it. The output is lagging. Okay, what happens if it's positive, though? Well, you can imagine. I'll try to draw a similar input. This means that the output comes before, well, we, we say that it leads. So this is my input, but somehow, output is leading and you know this is what um, a good example of this it doesn't happen for like just regular physical systems but this can happen in control systems so let me give you an example um, let's say you're driving a car and you are like the controller of the vehicle. If you see like an obstacle coming up in the road, you anticipate what you're going to have to do and you kind of um, make these anticipatory movements in the car. Before you get to the obstacle. Actually, I don't know if that's the best example. But you get what I mean. At least you, you get the difference between a negative phase and a positive. Positive is like the output is preceding the input somehow. It's leading. Okay. We're going to talk about Bode plots. Because a Bode plot is a graphical way... Let's, okay. Let's define it. Graphical way for visualizing the magnitude and phase of a frequency response function. So we're going to make a Bode plot for this um, transfer function we've been working with. Okay, so here's our transfer function. I'll zoom in here. 
we have it um, so this is written just a little bit differently but it's the same transfer function our transfer function is 1 over tau s plus 1 so this is implying that tau equals 1 over omega c and we'll talk about this this has a special name um, Or omega c is one over tau. Heck, we'll, we'll, I'm going to give you the name right now. Why wait? Omega c, we call it the corner frequency. And you'll see why in a second. Okay, so what I want to do is fill out this table. So this column is the magnitude of the frequency response function. This column is the, oh, this is also the magnitude. but it's in decibels. So we'll talk about how to convert something into decibel quantities. Maybe I'll write that out. Magnitude in decibels. And then this is the phase of the frequency response function which so far we've been writing it as like this angle operation. But uh, people tend to write that phase uh, using the Greek later letter phi. So if you see phi, it just means the phase of the frequency response function, telling you if the output leads or lags. Okay. So the way this table works, this first column is the input frequency. So as the table goes down, we're increasing the frequency. We have like faster and faster sinusoids. All right, so let's remind ourselves, because we did the work up above of figuring out what these were. So I think this was, I need to check, make sure I got this right. One over square root, okay, okay, I think I got it. 1 over the square root omega squared tau squared plus 1. And let's write tau in terms of the corner frequency because this table is using corner frequency. So that's going to be because tau is 1 over the corner frequency, so this will be omega squared over the corner frequency squared plus 1. Square root of that. Okay. So for the first case, we're going to have omega is equal to one thousandth of the corner frequency. So um, there's not much space in that little box to do the work. So how about we do the first one 
over here. So if I substitute for omega, one over a thousand omega C I, that's gonna be equal to one over the square root of well, the omegas will cancel out, won't they? So it'll be 1 over 1,000 squared plus 1. If you square 1 over 1,000, that's 1 over 1 million, which is a really small number. Let's do this in MATLAB. This is going to come out to be equal to 1, but okay, 1 divided by the square root. Wait, I don't need parentheses here. Square root of 1 divided by 1000 squared plus 1. And it's, you know, it's it's equal to one. Like maybe if you, I don't know if you know this, if you type format long, it'll show you way more decimal points. So this is point nine 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 five. But it's basically one. Let's be real. It's one. Now, you guys were mentioning decibels earlier. So mathematically, um, converting something into decibels is done in this way. It's 20 times log base 10 of that number. So if you take 20 log base 10 of 1, well, what's the log base 10 of 1? Do you guys know that one? I don't know if it's popular to study logarithms that much anymore. But log base 10 of 1, the way you answer that, it's 10 to the what equals 1. Well, 10 to the 0 equals 1. So log base 10 of 1 is 0. So this is 0 decibels. And before we do phase, how about we... Um, let's just finish this table for the magnitudes. So if we do, if we plug in the second value for omega, well, we know what's gonna happen because we did this first one. It's gonna be one over 100 squared plus one, which is still a very small number. And it's basically gonna be one, okay? And if you plug in one over 10, we're gonna have one over 10 squared, um, this is basically going to be 1. Because we're basically dividing this by 1. 1 divided by 1 is 1. So th this is going to be 0. This is going to be 0. Okay, but what about once we get to the corner frequency itself? Well... If we calculate the magnitude in this case, it's going to be 1 over square root of 1 plus 1. 1 over the square root of 2. Which is, I'm typing that in MATLAB really quick, 0.707.
Now, if we're converting this to decibels, you take 20 log base 10 of 0 0.707. And I'm doing that in MATLAB. Maybe I'll show you how to do that. In MATLAB, you have to be careful. You have to type log 10 to make sure it does, you know, the logarithm with base 10. If you just type log, it'll do log base E. Okay, so this is minus three decibels. I ran out of room here. So, okay. Come on, buddy. There it goes. So for frequencies lower than the cutoff frequency, the magnitude of the frequency response function is basically one for this transfer function. But once you get to the corner frequency, it becomes a little less than one and in decibels it's at minus three. Okay, let's do 10 times the corner frequency. Then I'm gonna have, okay, it's gonna be 10 omega C I. This is gonna be one over the square root of 10 squared plus one, which is basically um, one divided by 10. Now, if we convert that to decibels, you have 20 log base 10 of 0 0.1. Log base 10 of 0 0.1 is minus one and you multiply that by 20, and you get minus 20 decibels. And then I'm gonna fill in the rest of this for you. If you do 100 times the corner frequency, it's 0 0.01, and you're gonna get minus 40. This one you're gonna get 0 0.001, and you're gonna get minus 60 decibels. So the reason we use um, so how do you have something negatively loud? Oh, good question. So that's the thing about decibels, especially when it comes to sound. Um, actually, Wikipedia has a great article on decibels for sound. So um, when you say something is, like earlier you said something was 141.7 decibels. All right, we're gonna, this is the way I understand it. So you say, well, how loud is your stereo? 141.7 decibels. Okay. This is 20 log base 10 of a ratio. And I think it's something like this. Um, It's the, I think it's a, oh, how do you say it? It's gotta be sound pressure uh, from your stereo. Oh, go away, why is this, okay. And then it's relative to the sound pressure of the softest perceptible sound. And they, it's kind of, they made some standard for this, right? So, what this is saying, let's solve for this ratio. 
I'll call this ratio R. It's basically how much louder your speaker is than like the softest perceptible sound. So, okay, let's solve for that ratio. 20 log base 10 of R is 141.7. So that means log base 10 of this ratio is 141.7 divided by 20. That means that ratio is 10 to the 141.7 divided by 20, which is like 7. So this is saying your stereo is like 10 million times louder than the softest perceptible sound. That's my understanding of what it means. DB. Acoustics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look at this. The pressure... The measured sound pressure relative to a standard reference sound pressure, which is 20 micropascals. Oh wait, maybe? Can you hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reference pressure for sound is the typical threshold of perception of an average human ear. Every 10 decibels is two times as loud. No, no, I think it's, I think it's much more than that. Oh, this is a cool little... Dang it, this is not zooming the way I want. 60 decibels, normal conversation. But even 60 decibels is, uh, let me think, 60. That's a thousand times louder than the minimum perceptible. Or uh, louder isn't the right term. It has a thousand times the sound pressure. The loudest possible tone, 194 decibels. Wow. But, so the point of decibels as a mathematical unit is to take very small or very large numbers and transform them into like a more reasonable number. Like 190 decibels, it's got to be, well, okay, let's, let's do when we actually calculated. Like 140 decibels is... 10 to the 7th, right? That's 10 million. And we've transformed it to a number like 140. Now, decibels can go negative, and that just means that, um, like, if, if a sound had negative decibels, it would mean that this ratio of the sound pressure, it means that your stereo is producing less sound pressure than the minimum perceptible sound so it would just basically mean you can't hear your stereo maybe a dog could i don't know did you guys know that about db you can tell i so i've taught this a couple times and then um I mean, I'm interested in like, wait, how does this connect to sound? And like, most students are as well. So that's why I know, <laughs> I know that just from this class, because I was like, I need to look this up to understand what the heck this is. But it is pretty interesting. Now you know, th there's actually an app for your phone you can get that measures dB. That's kind of fun. Okay, let's do the, let's do the phase. Well, okay, so actually let's let's plot this before we move on to the phase. Let's imagine 
that the cutoff frequency is 10 radians per second, which is a little bit more than one cycle per second. Kind of low frequency. Um, what I want to do is I want to plot the magnitude of the frequency response function in decibels as a function of frequency. You'll notice on these graphs, the lines are spaced a little weird on the horizontal axis. This is called a semi-log scale. And the way it works, um, numbers 10 times apart are equally spaced. That's how it works. So look at, um, okay, this 10 squared versus 10 cubed. So this is 100, this is 1000. They are 10 times different from each other and they're this distance, okay? Well, if you compare 10 cubed to 10 to the fourth, that's 10,000. 1,000 and 10,000 are 10 times different from each other, and that's the same distance. See what I mean? And then the same thing works for these little intermediate lines. Like, let's do, um, let's do this one. 10 to the zero is one. And then this next line is two. And then this is three. That line is four. And then it goes five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then you get to 10. So four, if I take 10 times four, I get 40. Well, this is 10, 20, 30, 40. So four and 40, which are 10 times apart, You'll notice it's the same distance as 10 is to 1,000 or 1,000 is to 10,000. That's how a semi-log scale works. And it works really wonderfully for Bode plots. You'll see it in a second. Uh, okay, so we're gonna plot the data from our table assuming that the corner frequency is 10 radians per second. So uh, let's start with the corner frequency itself. We know that it should be at minus 3 decibels. So let's go to 10 on here. So 10 to the 1, 10 radians per second. I know that I should be at minus 3 decibels. So this is like minus 10 Uh, this would be minus 5 approximately. I'm going to say minus 3 is like right here. Okay. And then looking at the table, prior to the cutoff frequency, the magnitude was 0. So if I go one-tenth, so one-tenth of the cutoff frequency is one. The decibels is going to be zero. If I go to one one-hundredth, one one-thousandth, and any other number, it's, it's zero. Okay? Maybe we'll label this to make it clear. Omega C... This is one tenth omega c, one one hundredth omega c, one one thousandth. But what happens when you go higher than the cutoff frequency? If I go 10 beyond, I'm at minus 20 decibels. If I go 100 beyond, I'm minus 40 decibels. Okay. So 10 beyond 10 is 100. 
which is 10 squared, and I'm at minus 20. And then if I go 100 beyond, I'm at minus 40. If I go 1,000 beyond, I'm at minus 60. And I think you can see the trend here. Let's kind of connect these lines. If we evaluated any points in between, we'd kind of see something like this. Let's point out three main features here. Okay, the first feature, I'm gonna put like a vertical line at the corner frequency, which was 10 in this case. So first feature, the magnitude of the frequency response function, well, I wanna put this 20 log 10 out in front equals minus three at the corner. So when omega is equal to omega C, the cutoff frequency or the corner frequency, the magnitude is minus three. Okay, the second observation. For omega less than the corner, if you take the magnitude converted to decibels, it's zero. Okay, the third observation. Look at the slope of this line. Every 10, well, every 10 times, so that's, that's called a decade, actually. I didn't mention that earlier. Something, uh, a, a distance on this graph of 10 times apart is called a decade. And if you look, every decade, this drops 20 decibels. So this line has a slope of minus 20 decibels per decade. So that's my third observation. Oh, that's, that line is way too thick. Slope of minus 20 decibels per decade after omega C. Something like this happens for all first order transfer functions. So there's lots of different types of systems out in the world, but as we know, all systems are built up of a combination of first and second order systems. Like if I have a weird seventh order system, well, it might be two distinct real roots, two pairs of complex conjugate roots, and then maybe like another distinct real root. So it's a combination of three first order systems and two second order systems. So the point I'm trying to make is all first order systems have um, a magnitude Bode plot that behaves something like this. And higher order systems, when you're making their Bode plot to look at the frequency, um, you can just add up all of the different components. So I think on Monday we'll be, we'll be able to do some examples of that. Um, and remember the physical significance of this. This is saying that if I give an input frequency that's lower than the corner frequency, 
Well, the amplification, it, uh, the output signal amplitude is the same as the input signal amplitude because the amplification is just one. Once I get past the corner, my output amplitude starts to shrink and it drops off dramatically beyond the corner frequency. That's how first order systems work. Okay, let's do the phase and then we'll take a break. A fly just came into this room. I hate the sound of flies. I hope it leaves. All right, let's get the phase. What's the DB of that fly? It's gonna be really low really soon because I'm gonna smash, I'm gonna smash it. You walk around your house with a rag and whiplash ninja them. That, that's the same thing that I'm going to do to this freaking fly. Its days are numbered. Okay. Phase. Okay. I think we actually might be able to fit these calculations in these boxes. Okay. The definition, if my pen will work is the inverse tangent of let's check the definition to make sure we did it earlier negative omega tau over one okay If we do that in terms of the corner frequency, well, it's just um, negative omega over omega C. So in this case, if omega is one over 1000 omega C, This is going to be minus 1 over 1,000, right? Which is 0. And um, if you do 1 over 100 omega C, you'll get the tan inverse of minus one over 100. And this is uh, approximately zero. This one, approximately zero. But if you go to omega C, you're gonna get tan minus one of minus one. And this is gonna be, if we convert it to degrees, you're gonna get minus 45 degrees. And then this one, if we go 10 beyond the corner, it's gonna be tan minus one of like minus 10 over one, which is minus 90 degrees or very close to it. And then this one is also minus 90 degrees. So this will make, uh, the trend will become more clear when we 
plot this below. Oh, and if you go to a thousand, it's also minus 90 degrees. Let's plot it. So once again, we're gonna assume that omega C is 10. Let's draw like a, a line there. At the corner, the phase was uh, minus 45 degrees. If I went 10 times slower in frequency, it was like zero degrees and it stayed there for lower frequencies. When I went 10 times higher, it went up to 90 or minus 90 degrees and then it, it stayed there. So if you connect these with kind of a smooth trend, it looks something like this. So what does this mean physically? Remember the meaning of the phase. The phase tells you how much your output leads or lags the input. This is saying if you go to lower frequencies than the corner frequency of the system, then the output and the input, there's like zero phase between them, meaning they're basically in sync. So they're moving with each other. That makes sense for something really, really slow. Because even if there's like a little bit of delay, um, the input's moving so slow, you can't really tell a difference between the two. Once you get to the corner, the output delays by minus 45 degrees. So that's a, um, an eighth of a cycle. I think. And then when you get faster than that, it's minus 90 degrees, a quarter of a cycle. That's how far behind the output will be. Okay, so let's make three observations for this, then we'll take a break. And then we're going to apply this. I'm going to show you how you use this to model something in real life. Okay, so one. Um, phase is minus 45 degrees at the corner when your input frequency equals the corner frequency. Uh, second, um, do, 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 do. How do we say this? Okay, one decade prior to corner. So one decade, this was, our corner's at 10. One decade prior is one-tenth. Phase equals zero degrees. And then uh, one decade after corner, our phase is minus 90 degrees. Very interesting. This is something you see for all first order systems. There's so many different first order systems out in the world. I'm going to show you that the the DC motor we were playing with yesterday it behaves like a DC it behaves like a first order system. And we're going to exploit the properties of this Bode plot to fit the motor with a model. 
It's going to be a first order model and it's going to work pretty darn well as you're going to see. Okay, let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back to this. Are you guys having a good Friday? That fly is gone. I'm going to shut the door. Oh, 
Okay. Let's get right back to it. Let's continue. So we have gotten magnitude and phase for this first order transfer function graphically represented with a Bode plot. So the combination of the magnitude and phase plot is called a Bode plot. It's called a Bode plot. Okay. So, um, just to drive home once again the physical significance of the Bode plot, we're going to go into MATLAB. Um, we're going to build this transfer function that we've been working with, and then we're going to provide it a sinusoidal input. So I'm going to show you how to use the TF command to make a transfer function object in MATLAB. If you have MATLAB on your computer, maybe you can follow along. But we're going to make our transfer function. So I'm going to say g equals transfer function. And um, what you do is you put a numerator polynomial and uh, a denominator polynomial. So let's look at what our transfer function looks like. Let's use this form. So it's one over one over mega C S plus one. Okay. So omega C, our corner or cutoff frequency, for the example, we said it was 10 radians per second. Um, so my numerator polynomial is well, it's just one. The denominator though is one over omega C times S plus one. So it's just like making polynomials like we did um, for anything else we've done in this class. So let's run this code and you'll see that this makes a transfer function. I'm just saving this as in class. And then I like to put the date so I remember what the heck it was. Okay, so I ran this, let's clear everything. And then my transfer function, I called it G. So MATLAB now knows, hey, you made a transfer function. Great. Um, ooh, I didn't think I was going to show you this command, but it makes sense. So we just drew a Bode plot, right? Well, you can do Bode of G and let's see what it comes up with. It takes a little second to load, but you'll notice this looks very similar to what we just made. The magnitude plot is on top. So you can see down here, this is on a semi-log scale. At 10, that's the corner frequency. The magnitude is at like minus three decibels. And then it slopes off 20 decibels per decade after the corner. 
it's zero before that. And then if we look at the phase at the corner, it's minus 45 degrees. If we go a decade later, it's approximately zero. Actually, it's more like a five or five degrees or something, but close enough. And then over here, it's getting closer to minus 90 degrees. So we have a Bode command, which creates a plot like we just made by hand. Okay, but what I really wanted to do is um, test the Bode plot. So I want to make a time vector. We'll say it's zero to DT to like uh, 10 seconds. And I like to make this into a column. So I put this little transpose. DT, I'm just gonna make up something that I know is pretty small. And then I'm gonna make an input and it's gonna be, it'll have an amplitude of one and it's gonna be sine omega C times T. Actually, let's make this a little generic. I'll define an omega variable. And for this particular case, I'll say omega is equal to omega C, which is our corner. And then I'm gonna use LSIM. How do I, okay, that's how I use it. YT is LSIM which we've used before. I, you put your model in here. You could put a state space model or a transfer function. It's all the same to MATLAB. So I put my model in here, which is a transfer function. I put my input, I provide my time vector, and then it gives me my output. And I want to plot my output, of course. Let's make it in red. But I also want to plot my input. So I'm going to put them on the same graph. And I'm going to beef up the line width. I'm going to put on my axis label. And I'm going to make a legend just to be really clear. My output and input. OK, hopefully this works. Ooh, okay, okay, okay. So, our out, our input is in blue, is a sinusoid, okay? Our output is in red, and you see that the output kind of lags the input, it's behind. Like the peak of this happens after the peak of the input. Now, steady state, is um, when it starts to look the same over and over and over and over again after the settling time. You see this first peak looks a little different, it's a little higher. Well, that's because steady state hasn't been reached yet. But over here, it's safe to say it's at steady state. If I look at the amplitude ratio between the two of these, the amplitude of my input is one, the amplitude of my output is like point seven zero seven yeah do you remember in our table at the corner the amplitude ratio which is the same as the magnitude of the frequency response function is point seven zero seven Beautiful. And um, minus 45 degrees phase shift is what we should be seeing. And that is um, an eighth of a complete cycle. So yeah, we see the blue peak and then it's followed like if we divide the period by eight, this is like an eighth of a period before we see 
the output reaches peak. Makes sense? So, when you look at a Bode plot and you see, okay, at the corner the phase is minus 45 and the magnitude, or this is also called the amplitude ratio, is minus 3 decibels, that's saying if you provide an input at a certain frequency, this is what you're going to expect to see in the output. But this is telling me for many, many different possible input frequencies. Like we just simulated the corner. What if we simulate a different one? Let's do 10 times the corner. What do we expect to see? If I go 10 times omega c, well, before we run it, let's guess what we're gonna see. Well, 10 times the corner is right here at 100. I expect to see minus 20 decibels, which, what does that actually mean? Twenty log base ten of my output amplitude over my input amplitude is going to be equal to minus twenty. So log base ten output over input equals minus one. So the output over my input is going to be equal to 10 to the minus 1, which is 1 tenth. So, from the Bode plot, I expect the output to be a tenth the amplitude of the input, okay? And I expect that the phase angle is going to be close to minus 90 degrees, which is lagging by one quarter of a cycle. So if I take the period of oscillation divided by 4, that's the amount of time I expect it to lag. Okay, we run it. Oh. Let's simulate this a little bit shorter time. Okay. Look at this. The input amplitude is 1. The output amplitude is... 0.1. A tenth less which is what we predicted and then if we compare how much it's lagging you can see it's lagging a little bit more and the distance between these peaks that delay it's like a quarter of the period of oscillation so when you look at the Bode plot you already know what the system's going to do at different frequencies. It's beautiful. And this blank space, I think I'll just fill that in later with those little examples we just did. Okay, this... Um, we won't fill in this whole thing but um, before we get, because what we're going to do next is we're going to look at our data from the motor and fit it with the transfer function. But something we're going to need to do that is we're going to have to know the effect of gain. So look at this transfer function. It's very similar to the one we had before, but you'll notice one difference. It has this term K in the numerator. When you multiply a transfer function by a constant, like k, that's called adding a gain. Like on, a, on an amp, you might increase the gain. That's, very, uh, that's the same thing as this. It's just modulating your transfer function. It's, mo it's multiplying it by a constant factor. So the effect of that is...
Um, the let's talk about the amplification or the the magnitude of the frequency response function. This increases by a factor k. So whatever we calculated before, now we just multiply that by k. So before this was 1, or basically 1, so we'll multiply by k. And this was also 1, so it'll be k, this will be k, uh, this will be 0 0.707 times k. What was this one? It was like 0 0.01. Yeah, or 0 0.1. So this is 0 0.1 times k, 0 0.01 times k, 0 0.01 times k. And then when you convert these to decibels, well, all that is is taking 20 log base 10 of whatever number you had. Uh, da, da, da. We'll check this out though. Point seven oh seven times K, right? This is the same as twenty log base ten of point seven zero seven plus twenty log base ten of K. So when we convert this to decibels, everything that happens is this increases by 20 log base 10 of K. And the phase is unaffected. It is unaffected. It doesn't change at all. Okay, so what I want to get to is how does it affect um, the graph? So here, let's, for example, assume k equals 10. Well, we know this affects the amplitude ratio by adding 20 log base 10 of K um, to everything. And that'll just be 20. So originally, let's keep the corner frequency at 10. Originally, we had a plot that looked like this, and then it drops to like minus three at the corner, and then it went minus 20, minus 40, minus 60. When we add this gain, to our transfer function, everywhere we increase by 20 decibels. So let's draw like this whole thing shifted up 20 decibels. So this is after adding the gain. 
So the output amplitude increases. K equals 10. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 100. And this one, uh, this was the original. And the, the amount that we increased it, once again, 20 log base 10 of K, which equals 10 decibels. And then if we draw the phase, it's going to be exactly the same. It's unaffected. It's at minus 45 at the corner. It looks something like this. So this is unaffected by the gain. Okay, now we're getting to the, the cool part because we have all the knowledge we need to get a model for this DC motor we played with on Wednesday. So that's what we're gonna do next. Okay. Let's get right into it. Okay, so we had we had a six volt brushed DC motor and we drove it at a couple different frequencies. Uh, and these are the frequencies we tried. So this one was six hertz. This one was five hertz and so on and so forth. But we drove it with a bunch of different input frequencies. And what we did is we calculated the amplitude ratio. So the ratio of output amplitude over input amplitude. So like for this low frequency, the output amplitude, or I mean the amplitude ratio was like close to two. And then as we increased frequency, it went down, went down, went down. Check this out though. If we, um, so what, what we're gonna do, take that same information, but convert Y axis to decibels. So here you can see I took 20 log base 10 of the original quantity. So that just converted it to decibels. And uh, so that's one thing we changed. And then convert X axis to a semi log scale. And once again, semi log just means anything that's 10 times different is equally spaced. So 10 and 100, those are equally spaced. And check out the shape of this. It looks kind of similar to the Bodhi plots that we've been making, right? It's like flat for some time and then it kind of reaches a corner and then it drops off. I mean, it's not perfect because um, nothing in life is perfect, but it looks pretty darn similar. So what I wanna do is I want to try to make up 
a transfer function that behaves like this. And the type of transfer function that we need, so we're gonna to try to fit this experimental data with a transfer function and we're going to try to use this which um, by the way is the same tau is one over the corner frequency, right? Okay. So what I'm gonna to try to do is first identify a corner frequency. So the corner is where um, the amplitude starts to drop three decibels. So if we assume that like whatever this is, maybe six decibels, if that's our like flat point, then if I subtract three decibels from there, that should be kind of where the corner is. So let's say the corner is like here or something. And um, so this is 10 radians per second over here. This is 20 radians per second. Uh, so maybe this corner, let's say it's like 16 radians per second. And so I'm gonna plug in this number here. So I'm just doing this visually. Okay, now let's draw Because remember, um, without this gain term, the transfer function or the, the magnitude would start at zero and then it would drop to minus three. But we want it to start instead at six. So I'm just gonna draw this real quick. So minus three. And uh, what's a decade? So minus 20. Mine's gonna look like this. But then if I add a gain, it'll look something like uh, this. So I need to contribute this much. So six is equal to 20 log base 10 of this gain. So that means the gain is, or let's do this in a couple steps. Log base 10 of the gain is six divided by 20. So the gain is 10 to the six divided by 20. Ten to the six divided by twenty. So from this, I'm saying my transfer function. What is ten to the six divided by twenty? Uh, 
That's basically two. It's like 1.99. 1 over 16s plus 1. So by analyzing the Bode plot of my motor, I'm saying I think that this first order transfer function can pretty well describe the dynamics. Let's see how it works. Okay, let's go into MATLAB. Let's go, let's go. Let's clear and like close stuff. Okay. So I did some of this in advance. Okay, let's say my transfer function, we said it was two and then like one divided by 16. So what I wanna show you is, oh wait, I need to run this. Go, go, go. So this is doing in MATLAB what I just did on paper with you guys. If the cutoff frequency is at 16, and if you set the gain equal to two, this is the predicted frequency response. And actually, now that I'm in MATLAB, I think we could make this look a little better because it looks like this red line is too much on top of the data. It's not really running through the points. So I think I can fix this by backing off the corner frequency a little bit. Um, so instead of 16, I'm going to shift the corner to the left. Let's see how this looks. Ooh. And now you see, it looks a little better. Now, if you remember, we gathered, I mean, the, the whole way we could calculate the amplitude ratio is we gathered a bunch of data in the first place. Um, where we gave a sinusoidal input, we measured the sinusoidal output. I want to compare, I want to compare the actual data to the data from this model. So I'm gonna make this plot and then I'm gonna tell you what it is. Oh, let's put a legend. So I'm plotting experimental data. That's what we measured with the sensor. And then this is the data from our model that we just made. That's pretty sweet, right? Our model, this is the two hertz experiment where we gave a sinusoidal voltage to the motor and the motor spun back and forth. This uh, sinusoid is showing the motor speed as a function of time. So this first order transfer function that we made up by analyzing a Bode plot it replicates the behavior of the real life system pretty well. I mean, this kind of makes sense because I think this point was the two Hertz experiment and you see that our Bode plot passes right through it, meaning that we're matching that data pretty well. Um, some of this data might not match as well. Like if we do the data from our second experiment, I think our model is going to over predict the amplification. Let's check. So we're gonna do the second experiment. 
This is pretty inefficient coding that I have to change all these numbers every time, but that's okay. Oh, it doesn't look too bad. So once again, the black dots, that's the data we actually gathered from an experiment. The red, this beautiful smooth line is what our model predicts. Isn't that gorgeous? So something I want you to appreciate is um, dynamic systems, this was just one system, this was like a motor. Um, you're gonna see first order systems in lots and lots of different disciplines. It might be chemical engineering, electrical. Well, we've done some electrical systems with circuits that were first order. So what I'm saying is you could run a similar experiment, make a plot, a Bode plot, uh, do the same kind of analysis, and you could make a model that behaves like that system for any frequency. Let's test another one. I don't know. Let's do one of our faster tests. This one was at 5 hertz, 5 cycles per second. That was our seventh test. Go, go, go. So now our model, it's doing a little worse. For one, our model is leading the what we actually measured in the experiment. Um, so like the model has a peak that comes before uh, this experimental peak. Also, the amplitude is a little bit off. Our model under predicts the amplitude of the output signal. So you see it's not perfect. It's pretty good though. Testing, testing. Oh, okay. So the last thing we're gonna do Let's take our transfer function that we just came up with for this motor, 1 16th S plus 1. And remember, a transfer function is equal to the Laplace transform of the output over the Laplace transform of the input and it's um, y over s over u over s, right? So I'm going to write it like that. If I manipulate this a little bit, to u of s, right? So basically, you'll, you'll see what I want to do. I want to turn this back into a time domain differential equation. So I'm working backwards here. Remember, S times something is the same as the first order derivative in the time domain. So this is like 1 16th y dot of t plus y of t is 2u of t. So I'll have, if I multiply everything by 16, equals 32u of t. 
So just like that, I can take my transfer function and turn it into a differential equation where y is the motor speed in radians per second and u is the input voltage in volts. And you guys know how to analyze these equations at this point, right? So you could say, hey, what's the time constant of my motor? Well, I would form the characteristic equation. So I'll say, oh, this system has one real root at minus 16. So that means the time constant is minus one over the real part of the root. So the time constant is 1 16th of a second. So that means the settling time is 1 quarter of a second. We never did the step input to our motor, right? We only did sinusoidal experiments. But using this model we came up with, I could predict what the step response looks like, right? Like, um, let's say that I give six volts. Like this is a six volt motor. What, what speed is my motor gonna go if I give it a six volt input? So, Basically, uh, what if u of t is 6 volts? That means y dot of t plus 16 y of t equals 32 times 6, which I'm struggling to do that in my head. So I'm just going to put that. So I know that... I have a particular solution, why particular, um, the particular solution is the same form as the input, so it's a constant, um, so that means the derivative is zero, so if I substitute this into the differential equation, I have 0 plus 16d is 32 times 16, which is 192, right? Therefore, d one ninety two divided by 16 is 12 radians per second. And um, so this is what the speed of the motor should get to because the homogeneous solution is going to die away. You could say the homogeneous is going to be some constant a times e to the minus 16t. So our complete solution is a e to the minus 16t plus 12. And if y0, like if it starts at rest, then I know this equals a plus 12, so A equals minus 12. So Y of T is minus 12 E to the minus 16 T plus 12. So I think this is really cool. This is saying, I predict that if you give six volts constant to that motor that we ran a test on, its dynamics are going to look like this. So you could tell somebody it's going to settle in one quarter of a second and the speed that it settles at is 12 radians per second. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool. That's some of the stuff you can do with this dynamic systems course.
So we'll end it there today with our lecture content. I hope you guys enjoy this because I think it's very useful, very practical. It's interesting, it's fun. You can apply these techniques to a broad spectrum of problems. All right, I'm gonna hang around for a little bit. If you have questions, um, I am gonna post a homework this weekend. So I'm gonna put that together, post it tonight. And uh, that's the plan. Thank you guys for rolling with me today. Thanks for your attention. You're very welcome, Michael. My pleasure. I enjoyed this lecture. I feel like it tied together some things.
Just wanted to say I appreciate your teaching style and lecture material. I actually use this class's material for 376. Oh, nice. Well, you're very welcome, Phil. I'm glad you uh, find it useful. That's my hope. Glad you could be in the class.
Alright everybody. I think I'm gonna call it. Have a fantastic weekend.